Okay, I started out as a sports writer for my local paper, the Staten Island Advance. And um, when I started out, I wanted to really educate myself on the best reporting ever. So I picked up this anthology of um, great articles and I mm, read it from cover to cover. And one of the books or one of the stories that really uh, stuck out to me was called Death of a Racehorse, which was first published on July 29th, 1949 in uh, The Sun, which was one of, I think, five daily newspapers in New York at the time. Anyway, it was written by W.C. Hines. Um, Hines was at a Jamaica, the Jamaica racetrack and this horse called Airlift uh, it was running his first race as a two-year-old and he had a great pedigree. His father was a bold venture who was a champion, a derby winner, and his brother uh, Assault uh, was a triple crown winner, which is basically the utmost in American horse racing. Anyway, on this sort of rainy day in Queens, uh, Airlift runs his first race and it shatters an ankle. And suddenly, the piece is written in this beautiful, like, dirge-like prose, and, you know, suddenly this horse has become just, like, worthless chattel, and, you know, they gotta call the trainer and owner to confirm that they're gonna put him down, and they decide to put him down, they shoot this horse between the eyes, this beautiful, gorgeous horse, it falls down, you know, its legs quiver, the veterinarians are kind of next to it, and they're cutting off the leg so they can give it to the insurance company. And uh, it ends like this. Um, then the heavens opened, the rain pouring down, the lightning flashing. And they rushed for the cover of the stables, leaving alone on his side next to a pile of bricks the rain running off his hide, dead an hour and a quarter after his first start, airlift, son of bold venture, full brother of assault. <sighs> wow. You know, I mean, the names themselves are already poetry, but then W.C. Hines turns it into a sentence that so good that I can just keep it in my head. W.C. Hines, by the way, also wrote a great novel uh, in 1958 called The Professional. It became a film, too, I think, which Hemingway called, at the time, the only good novel ever written about boxing. And the novel is, I mean, it's great. I mean, maybe it owes a little bit too much to the Hemingway style, but that's being picking, picky. It's a really, really impressive book. Anyway, back to horse racing. Um... I'm reviewing uh, two books, or talking about two books today. Laughing in the Hills, a story of life in the racetrack, written by Bill Barrich and published most recently by Sky Horse Publishing in 2015, although it was originally serialized in The New Yorker and then published as a book in 1980. It comes highly recommended. Uh, the Sports Illustrated... Mm, listed as one of the top 100 sports books ever written and I think Amazon listed in the top 10 sports books written in the 20th century. Uh, the other book I'm going to talk about is Something for the Pain, a memoir of the turf uh, by Gerald Murnane. This was published uh, for the first time in 2015 by the Text Publishing Company in Australia. Murnane is an Australian writer. Um, anyway, one of the things, I mean, I'm not uh, a horse racing fan, but I've always sort of enjoyed reading books about it and seeing films about it. There's something that's very evocative about it, and I think the names have a tremendous, or play a tremendous role in that, you know? Uh, not only in W.C. Hines' piece, but for example, just a random sampling of names from Barrich's book. Okay, um, Moonlight Cocktail, Chill Factor, um, Spicy Gift, uh, Wind Chime, Bargain Hostess, Sailing Flag, and Pass Completion. Okay, now a random sampling from Something for the Pain, On Parade, 
faithful city. Doll Prince. Money Moon. Gin Lane. Palatial. Rain Lover. And Summer Fair. Do you see how there, each one is like a little haiku? I mean, this is alone is a kind of reason to read both books, okay? Um, there is a line in Gerald Murnane's book. I mean, there's no bigger horse racing fan or horse racing lover than Gerald Murnane. Yet he says that he is someone for whom horse racing is better imagined than experienced. You know, I think perhaps maybe all great readers can be lumped into that category where very often we prefer to read about something than actually experience it. Our imagination gets involved and makes it even richer. So, yeah, we'll talk more about that. Okay, let's start with Barrage's book. It starts out in a very memoirish way. Um, he's, his mother has cancer, terminal cancer. He's having problems with his wife. There have been miscarriages. He's not really specific about them, but he decides that he wants to just get away from his life. And so what he does is he takes $500 in $20 bills and moves to Albany, California, where there's the Golden Gate Fields Thoroughbred Racetrack, holds up in the terrace, this hotel, and decides he's going to read the racing form every day and become what Gerald Murnane calls a punter, which is an amateur race handicapper, and just hope that through his attention to the races, it will obliterate all other concerns. He's there for the spring. Right? So it begins in this way, and it's very, very memoirish. But that sadness that he talks about is never really developed in the book. And I'm not faulting Barrich for this, let me be clear, because I think in 1980, really, generally speaking, only famous people wrote memoirs. Unknown people didn't write memoirs. Barrich wasn't unknown, but you know what I mean. Um, and just the fact that he included this much of his personal life into a book like this was groundbreaking, okay? Uh, a book like this. It's basically an in-depth, behind-the-scenes look at the horse racing world. It's got the kind of Joseph Mitchell, New Yorker feel. You know, he talks to uh, owners, trainers, grooms, vets, uh, jockeys, mm, race callers. There's 10 chapters in the book. Perhaps my favorite chapter is chapter four because that's when he starts winning. He, go, he gets on a roll. The way he describes his first horse winning and just knowing it's gonna win. And in this chapter, he talks about the difference between what he calls magic and luck. And, uh, you know, it's a tour de force in a way because he's talking or writing about the unknown, about unreachable realms. He describes how he was, I think he says, in touch. When I walked through the grandstand, I projected the winner's aura, blue and enticing. Women smiled openly as I passed. Uh, he also works in Machiavelli and this sort of third-rate horror film called Tarantula. It's impressive. Also, there's a chapter, I think it's chapter six, where he goes back 16 years earlier to when he was 19 years old and uh, spent a semester abroad, abroad in Florence when his pursuits were art, wine, women, and poetry. It's a very short chapter. In, in many ways, it doesn't fit in the book. It is memoirish, this chapter. 
he tries to make it fit by putting throughout the book these kind of very academic references to ancient Florentine culture, which really don't work for me, but it's it's a minor thing. But this chapter six is, is impressive. I mean, it's hard to evoke um, those early years. And he, he really manages to pull it off. Um, but as I say, it's the behind the scenes world that makes this book special. You know, let me just get this out of the way. I recommend both these books. I, I couldn't recommend them more highly, really. But I would recommend reading them both together. Because on the one hand, you've got Barrich's depiction of the American racing world, right? But it doesn't have much memoir in it. While Gerald Murnane's book, which was published in 2015, and really is pure memoir, is this kind of... I mean, I would say that Barrich's book is conventional in many ways. And that's not a put down. I mean, it is tremendously well done. But it's conventional. It's, it's, it reads like a New Yorker piece, the best possible New Yorker piece, which is, I mean, we all know is impressive, especially in 1980 when that magazine was still, you know, firing on all cylinders. Um, and then you get Gerald Murnane's almost Proustian, he's a huge fan of Proust, vision of his inner world. He is a huge racing fan, but as I said earlier, the book opens, Murnane's book opens with this scene where he's driving on the highway and he's listening to some racing and he's getting caught up in it, hearing the names and the colors, the racing colors. He has no sense of smell, Murnane. So he feels like colors speak to him. So every time he names a horse, he puts the racing colors after it. I'll get to that. But he's this whole evocative world is sort of happening in his head. And he notices there's a truck behind him who's, uh, you know, being delayed by Murnane getting caught up in this world. So Murnane pulls off the highway and he's in, you know, the bush because he lives in Australia, in Victoria. He grew up in outside Melbourne uh, in the Victoria province uh, and it's he's surrounded by sheep and he just shouts out the horse's name which he remembers from childhood which is something for the pain and he shouts it out in this field full of sheep the sheep look at him they look away and he shouts it out again and that's how the book begins right I would say that it took me almost to the halfway mark before I was totally hooked on this book. You gotta give it time. There's a chapter called Orange Purple Sleeves Black Cap where he starts to speak about colors and how the racing colors evoke this enormous world for him. And that's where he talks about how the description or the illustration of something it makes is more powerful to him than the actual thing. Um, I mean, he is so good at making the ordinary extraordinary, right? If Barrich's book is conventional, this is a work of genius in the sense that, you know, there's nothing else like it or nothing else else will ever be like it in the sense that you've entered the consciousness of another person. Like after this chapter about colors, you know, I was completely won over to his, imagine, to his imagination. He also talks about something he calls demigods. Uh, where he remembers remembrance of things past by Marcel Proust and t 
talks about Marcel Proust's way of loving people from afar, uh, just wanting to be able to observe them from a distance and imagine the lives they live and imagining their what they admire and love and trying to like and changing to become something that they think the imaginer thinks the demigods would admire uh, <laughs> you know i never finished remembrance of things past that probably speaks to me not being quite the reader i would like to be but um i almost feel as though i'm reading proust when i'm reading Murnane, or i'm reading the kind of proust that i want to read really um yeah and then the penultimate chapter where he describes this project that he has where he's it's like a literary project of I'd say Finnegan's Wake proportions. It he's got he's created these two bodies of land called the Antipodes, and where six hundred races go on a year, with horses, jockeys, race tracks, race colors that he's invented. This alternate world. This and he's got it like he's been working on it for ten years. I mean, at one point, his wife asks him, like, where did you get the time to do this? And he responds to her, he says, or he, mentally, because she just walks away after asking him because she already knows the answer. But he says, for most of my adult life, I had devoted all of my free time to minding my own business in the truest sense of that expression right his imaginative world is so vivid and signature i would say which is why i call this a work of genius let's just say the final paragraph is probably the greatest or one of the greatest final paragraphs i've ever read to a book and it brings us back to Death of a Racehorse by W.C. Hines, because you got to read that piece too. I'm going to put the link below to Death of a Racehorse. So you got to read Death of a Racehorse first. And then when you get to the end of something for the pain, compare and contrast the last paragraph of something for the pain to the, I don't know, 750 words of death of a racehorse Pfft. wow true literary art right just true literary art